Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, do not adjust your sets. I am not Pastor Liz. Uh, I am Danielle, I'm the youth director here, and we're gonna be trying that I help with announcements uh, every once in a while. So I would like to welcome everybody here at church and those of you that are on Zoom. Uh, with those prayers on our hearts, please rise for worship. We do worship this morning and always in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, number 597. My hope is built. To open our hearts to God is to risk vulnerability, judgment, and condemnation. But throughout the scriptures, we learn that God is merciful and just, slow to anger and eager to forgive. Let us then risk our confession before God and one another. God of tender mercies, we admit that sometimes we don't know what to do with ourselves. We anger at the slightest insult and imagine great vengeance upon those who wronged us. We laze about in the good news of our faith and do not consider the deep commitment of faith. We care for ourselves, but not for others. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us. Help us to repent and make us whole. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. 
Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus, you bring us into your kingdom, of your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Holy Spirit, give to us today your wisdom, that we might treasure the life that comes from you and is redeemed through Jesus, the living Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us take a moment to share that peace with one another. Peace to all who are on Zoom today. Judges, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harish-seth Hegoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you, go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly, I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. And there Barak summoned Zebulon and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. This is the word of the Lord. Turn up. <laughs> Slowly making our way today. All right, friends, we're gonna come back here just a little bit. We're gonna imagine that this is a palm tree. Can you use your imaginations for that? All right, you can have a seat. I'm just gonna lounge up next to this. Okay, I wanna make sure I get my back on there. Okay, so when you hear the word court and judge, what do you think of? Like, what do you imagine? Politics, okay. <laughs> what else? More politics. More politics, okay. How are judges usually dressed? Um, like in a suit. In a suit? Yeah. yeah. They're in robes, yeah. They have fancy dark robes. Over in England, they wear powdered wigs. Yeah. What about a courtroom? A room full of people, yeah. People that are usually there to make a decision on what happened. When you think of a courtroom and a judge, do you think of a lady sitting underneath a palm tree? Not usually, right? No, but that's what our story was about today. So Deborah was a judge and a prophetess, and this is where she held court, under a palm tree. Now that's just not very normal, and especially back in those days for a woman to have such authority and power. But she was just an ordinary woman, and she led, and she was rewarded for that, and she followed God's word, and because she had faith in God, that's why she had this honor, this distinction. But she didn't hold it up here, she just was normal, sat under a palm tree, and led court. 
So you don't have to have all of these powers and titles and be this fancy person in a suit to do the right thing and to lead people. You can be an ordinary person. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to listen to you and to lead through your example. In your name we pray. Amen. Just a lady under a palm tree. <laughs> Thank you for that, Danielle. There is a whole cast of characters today in our narrative. Uh, we really should have handed out like playbills so that you could know what's happening when and to whom, right? So let me just start by painting a little bit of a picture. You already have a great picture of Deborah. Let me paint a picture of where we are and who else is involved in our story today. After wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, Israel has finally crossed the River Jordan into the land that was promised for them, the land flowing with milk and honey. Just one problem, well, problem number one anyway, uh, the Canaanites already live there. So Israel comes into this land, but they come with an army first, right? And they conquer the land and they take it as their own but they don't route all of the Canaanites out of the land, which leads to problem number two. The Canaanites that remain end up having a huge influence on the Israelites, and the Canaanite ways are not God's ways. And the book of Judges tells this overarching story of the cycle that Israel gets into during this time period, and it looked kind of like this. Things are going well for Israel. They live a couple generations in peace. They forget the Lord. They do evil in God's eyesight. God lets the natural consequences of that evil play out, which is that some outside group comes in and overtakes them, and they are oppressed by that group. They remember God, and they cry out for help. God raises up a judge who is not only an arbitrator between peoples, but a military commander, that judge saves them. All is well. They live in peace for a couple more generations until that judge dies, and the whole cycle starts over again. They forget the Lord. They do evil in the sight of the Lord, and around and around they go for a span of about 350 years. The people moved through this cycle from things are pretty good to things were not so great to things were terrible. They cried out, God sends the judge. It's kind of like uh, one, one commentator likened it to dirty laundry, right? Rinse, wash, repeat, just over and over and over again until the fabric is so threadbare that it can't hold. By the end of the book of Judges, the depths of the people's evil had grown so great that they hit rock bottom. That's not our story today, thankfully. Our story today in front of us is the people's fourth time through this cycle. It starts out with that telling line. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so for 20 years, Israel has been living under the rule of Jabin, the king of the Canaanites, and his leading general is Sisera, who has an army of 900 chariots filled with iron. And Sisera ruled ruthlessly over the Israelites and oppressed them and terrorized them until God spoke to Deborah under the palm tree, judge over Israel. And God told her to call the Israelite army general Barak and instruct him to go out against Sisera's iron-filled chariots in order to free Israel from under the thumb of King Jabin. But Barak says, I'm only going if you're going, Deborah, and if you're not going, I'm not going. 
So for his lack of confidence, Deborah says, all right, I'll go. But because you've chosen this course, your victory isn't going to be at your hands. It's going to be at the hands of a woman. And that is where our scripture ends for today. But of course, it's not the end of the story. And you all want to know who wins, right? Of course you do. All right, so if you keep reading Judges 4, you learn that Barak did, in fact, summon those 10,000 troops, and they went out against Sisera and his 900 chariots of iron and God confused them and filled them with panic, and, and Barak's army is successful. And they overthrow that army, and they take them all out, except for Sithra, the general. He sneaks away, and he flees to a nearby village, and he's met by a woman named Gile outside of her tent. You were assuming Deborah was going to be the woman that gets to be victorious, weren't you? But no, it is this suddenly this other woman, Jael, who's victorious. And she invites him in, and it says that she gave him a glass of milk. I don't know. To me, that's a really weird detail to put into the Bible, but there it is. And she covered him with a rug in order to hide him, but instead she killed him. And I'm not going to tell you how, because it is gruesome. You can go and read it for yourself. Finish Judges 4. Um, but in the, the, the bloody nature of his death, though, is like a reflection of the whole of the book of Judges. Think the Godfather, right? Or 300. Everybody see 300, right? Uh, just blood, blood, and more blood, war, war, and more war, the whole thing. It's just like this downward spiral. And I know what you're thinking. What is the point of this book then? Like, why is this story, this tragic, somewhat nasty little story even in the Bible? It's not a bad question. This book is unsettling. And it can leave us with a lot of questions. But maybe that is the point. The book of Judges ends up being a bit of a mirror that gets held up, albeit a hyperbolic mirror, hopefully, right, that challenges us to wonder where we are today in our own cycle of forgetting God's ways and living in the consequences and crying out to God in our own pain, sometimes other-inflicted, sometimes self-inflicted. I think that's part of the challenge, too, to reflect on and be honest about that. And then having God raise us up, heal us, cleanse us, and fill us with new life. I feel like sometimes I go through that cycle at least once on just a Tuesday, right? Anybody else feel like that a little bit, right? It's a little deflating to think about, isn't it? And yet, the book also raises up some heroes, like Deborah. Deborah is remembered as one of the finest rulers in her time. She is sought out for her counsel. She is referred to as judge, prophetess, mother of Israel. She was a wife. She boldly proclaimed the word of the Lord, and there were no controversies during her rule, which I know might seem like a small thing, but you could probably count on one hand how many leaders in Israel didn't have any controversies during their rule. And I love the way the artist for our Faces of Faith series depicts her in this imagery today. And in her write-up, Lauren Pittman, the artist, shares, in the midst of the oppression of her people, Deborah creates space for channeling God's wisdom. In the chaos of war, she finds stillness under a palm tree and tunes herself to God's voice. And I love how she brings this home to us. She continues, when I'm in far less stressful situations than direct oppression and imminent war, I struggle to remember to turn to God for counsel or comfort. In response to anxiety, instead of fostering an environment to receive God's direction, I often turn inward and try to carry the burden of the world on my own. Anybody relate to that this morning? I also have a hard time trusting 
my own intuition. When I feel a tugging on my heart, I often ignore it, devaluing my thoughts, insights, and emotions. And because of this, I fear I miss God's movement altogether. The wisdom of Deborah lies in her willingness to create space. Deborah shows us that in stillness, practicing attending to God with fierce trust, we can sift through the chaos of this world and align ourselves with the movement of God. The end of the book of Judges closes with a new refrain being repeated several times in the last few chapters, and it is also the very last sentence of the book kind of leaves you with this cliffhanger. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everybody did as they saw fit. In those days, Israel had no king. and Everyone did as they saw fit. And so this tragic tale closes with one last mirror that can be really difficult to stand in front of and wonder how much of that saying reflects my own life right now. But it also points us forward. For we know, we know the one who is king. And we pray each week that his kingdom would be here on earth as it is in heaven. In him, and it, it's Jesus, by the way, just in case, you know. The answer is always Jesus at church, right? In him, we have hope right? for all the battles that might rage within our own hearts, for all the battles that are raging in the world around us. We have hope in Jesus. So the book of Judges points us to the kings to come and to the messianic king, to Jesus, who rescues us first and foremost from ourselves. Amen? Thanks be to God for Deborah, who unsettles us, stirs in us, hopefully, a holy discontent for the way things are in the world for too many people, and who shows us to create space in our own hearts and lives for the movement of the Holy Spirit to give us direction, courage, and strength to follow that direction, and also eyes to see God's activity happening in the world right now, and then to have joy in that discovery. Blessings to you this week as you create that space in your own heart and in your own life. I pray that that space will be a blessing to you, that that space will be a fountain of life and peace and joy and courage as you step out in this crazy world and follow God's ways that are there to be a blessing for each of us and all of us. Amen. Oh, Lord of life, our only 
sweet. Truly our hope is in you. Truly our hope is in you. Oh, joy above all other loves, in you we find more than enough. We come as we are, oh, heal and restore, come light our hearts. For you, O oh Lord, our souls in stillness we. Please rise if you're able. And join me in the statement of belief that's printed in the bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Filled with the Holy Spirit, we join with the church in every place, praying for the world that God so loves. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for the life of Deborah, judge, prophet, mother of Israel, wise leader in a time of crisis. And we confess all the ways that we, like Israel, have turned away from ways, ignored injustice, and lived as we pleased while others suffer. Stir in us a holy discontent for the way things are in this world for too many people. Tune our hearts to your rhythm and peace. Help us carve out our space in our daily lives to listen for and hear your voice, and then give us Deborah's courage to follow. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, we give you thanks for the beauty of the earth all around us this morning and for the gift of life that courses through us. Be with those experiencing loss of water and those that are flooded with it, those who have had to evacuate repeatedly due to wildfires and those who are hungry. Fashion us into good stewards that all may know the beauty of the world. Lord, in your mercy, God of nations, we lay before you today all the nations at war in the world. Out of the ashes of conflict, may the phoenix of your love arise as people and nations resolve to find a path to peace. Lord, in your mercy, for this congregation, as we gather on Zoom and on Century Avenue, bless these spaces with your presence. Into your wide embrace, hold all those who are sick, wrestling with mental health and those who mourn. We lift to you especially Christopher, who is hospitalized with staph infection, Jim, who is in memory care, and Joyce, who is in transition care. We also lift up prayers for safe travels for Emily. Sophia, as she 
participates in the sport of horse jumping. Give to us all your rest, healing, safekeeping, and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Be with us now in this holy meal, that it might remind us that we are never alone, that you are always coming quickly to our side, sitting with us in the pain and the joy, and drawing us together as a community of grace. We lift all of our spoken and silent prayers to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to come to God's table at God's invitation, we hear these words of life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered together by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. For those communing with us on Zoom this morning, receive this gift of life with these words, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. For those here in the sanctuary, you are invited to come forward, receive the wafer of bread and the cup of red wine or white grape juice. There is a gluten-free station to my right, and empty cups go in the baskets at the tops of the aisles. The banquet of God's grace is prepared, and all are welcome. Lamb of God, you take
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ and made us one with all your people. We pray that you would send us... ...now in the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to all the world. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand now for our closing hymn, number 763, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.